All right, we are at the top of the hour. And again, it is so exciting to see we are at over 200 people are actually zoomed in. We have over 1,000 people registered for today's session. My name is Chris Turek. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications for Solar Energy International. And today we're extremely excited to have partnered up with Scanify for this great uh, webinar and panel discussion. So real quick, before we get, uh, uh, before we kick off, um, many of you who are on the uh, webinar today are, are past students or current students and alumni of SCI. But if you're not familiar with who Solar Energy International is, um, SCI empowers students, alumni, and partners to expand a diverse, inclusive, well-trained and educated solar workforce. Our aim is to promote sustainable economic growth, mitigate climate change and support energy independence. So for us, we are celebrating our 30th uh, anniversary of service to the industry. And what's really great about this screenshot that we've got up right here is it, it's kind of the embodiment of why we're all here today in this webinar. By 2015, we're going to need 11.9 million solar jobs. So think about that. That's actually more than three times than what actually exists today in the solar market. So there's a lot of big questions that we need to answer as an industry that Solar Energy International needs to answer as a training provider. Uh, we have more alumni and people working actively in the solar industry than any, any other training program in the world. So there's a lot of work that we have ahead of us. But the great thing is that working with uh, companies like Scanafly, we've got some pretty awesome ideas put, uh, to put into place to make sure uh, meeting those workforce needs. So one of the things that Solar Energy International is launching in a very short amount of time in the coming months, we are actually launching SEI Engage. Uh, if you are a student of SEI, you're probably very familiar with our current Solar Energy International online campus, where at any given moment, we have thousands of people from all over the world as part of that online learning community. But some of the feedback that we've received from specifically employers, though, is that that model of online learning where there's a course structure with a defined beginning and end time really does not meet the needs of the solar workforce. They really need to have something that's a little bit more flexible and being able to um, basically have access to SCI's learning modules so that way they can customize the learning pathways for their needs for their workforce. So with that, SCI Engage, what we're launching is this completely customizable learning platform for employers to basically work with our career services and our business development uh, director to come up with these customized learning pathways that are very specific to your workforce needs within your employment area. So that could be everything from if you've got people that you're just onboarding from the very day one, or you've got seasoned solar professionals that are, you know, they've been in the industry for over 10 years that need continuing education. So this new platform is going to allow you to work with SCI in a more customized on, online learning platform. So that way we can meet your needs as an employer. We wanna make sure we're ramping up the solar workforce as fast as possible. And with that, one of the great things with the SCI online campus is our ability to reach a, a lot of diverse audiences all over the world. So with that, I wanna hand it over to our executive director, Elizabeth Sanderson, to talk a little bit about how we're gonna be uh, reaching those diverse audiences from all over the world. So with further ado, Elizabeth, take it away. Thanks, Chris, and thanks for everybody coming. I'm looking at this scroll and, and people from Turkey and Austin, Texas, it's amazing. I really, really appreciate everyone showing up today. Probably the drone helped, but uh, we'll, you know, so we're happy to be a partner with Scanafly. Um, I'm the new executive director. I was hired to spread the SEI love to more people. And so we're excited to do that. Um, I'm also proud for the last 30 years that we have been really reaching out to a diverse audience. So we have had a tribal train the trainer program with our Native uh, Americans. We've had uh, most of our classes are also uh, conducted in Spanish for Latinx. And we were one of the first organizations to start women training women courses. And uh, so I'm really proud of that. But it's time to actually dig deeper and get stronger in all of those and to reach out to even more people. And so we have partnerships with um, organizations like BOSS, which is Black Owned Solar Services, or Youth Build, which is uh, 12, 18 to, to 24 younger people 
um, reaching out to more diverse audiences, uh, BIPOC, people of color, um, so that we're giving access to training to more people. And one of the things that we're doing is we're uh, figuring out a way at this point to do what we call mini labs to give more people access to hands-on training as well. So because everybody learns differently. And so one of the things that we're doing in order to, um, to diversify and to spread the love is to have what we call mini labs. So look forward to that. Um, there are a lot of other programs we're doing to reach out to more people, but uh, I'm really, really happy that you're all here today. And I hope to meet you in our travels in the future. Awesome, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And like Elizabeth said, um, probably one of the reasons why you are here today is we are gonna be giving away a drone at the end. So real quick, I'm actually gonna launch a poll because we actually wanna uh, hear a little bit about um, some of your experience that maybe you have with Scanafly and the services they offer, or what are your experience with drones in general? So I actually just launched a poll real quick. And if you can take a couple minutes and just go ahead and fill that out for us. And so while you're filling that out, um, I just wanna tee it up and uh, introduce you to Jason. So Jason and I have been working together for over the last year. Um, we work with a lot of different manufacturing partners and service providers in the industry to have that strong connection to industry. And I will tell you, Scanifly has probably been one of the most fun, funnest companies that we've worked with. One, because it's drones and who doesn't love drones? <laughs> but the fact that Jason and his team have developed such awesome tools for solar installation companies and EPCs of all various sizes to really um, take, you know, use technology of today to take the industry to where it needs to be. So with that, Jason, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Chris. I want to say a special thanks to Chris, Elizabeth, and SEI for letting Scanify partner with you on this webinar. Um, 30 years of workforce training is, is unbelievable. I mean, how many people do you think were in the solar industry 30 years ago? Uh, so it's a huge testament to SEI and your mission to educate, engage, and empower each other and the world to create a planet powered by renewable energy. It's really unbelievable. Um, as Chris said, I'm Jason Steinberg. I'm the CEO of Scanify. Um, I know a handful of people on the call uh, have joined our webinars in the past, but I still want to introduce Scanafly briefly to those of you who are new. Um, we believe at Scanafly that solar energy is the energy source of the 21st century, uh, as I'm sure many of you believe. Um, however, we also find that the industry is still using 19th century tools. All right, so 98% of solar contractors do an on-site survey by hoisting up a ladder uh, and climbing around the roof, right? So look at some of those roofs that we're showing here. 60% uh, of surveyors never feel fully safe on site. Once on the roof, surveyors are tape measuring to gather dimensions. Um, in some polls that we've run in the past, we found that about three quarters of surveyors are taking shortcuts because of safety concerns. And as a result, measurements can be fairly inconsistent. Some surveyors also do on-site shading analysis with a SunEye or Pathfinder tool, which are okay tools, but you're still going on the roof. Uh, other folks do remote shading exclusively with software and LIDAR, yet LIDAR coverage is actually pretty sparse and old in many areas. And then surveyors will take all of this data and write it down on scratch paper. All right, it gets handed to the designer back at the office who finalizes the layout to the best of his or her ability and pushes that information to construction documents. Uh, but can you read all of the details on this example of a scrap paper layout? So the surveying and design process that I've walked through is the most common that we see in solar. Over half of contractors, though, still have change orders or redesigns with 25% of their projects. And so looking at our theme today of celebrating workforce training and development, we want to discuss the key technology trends that will shape the future of solar. Said a bit differently, right? For those of us, you know, we believe that, you know, the 21st century is for solar, um, but what are those 21st century tools that we're gonna be looking towards, right? What is the future of workforce training gonna look like? And that's what we wanna unpack. Um, for about, about Scanify, right? So drones and Scanify software can be some of those solutions. Instead of the manual surveying and design process that I just walked through, solar contractors can fly drones, use 3D modeling and AI and other technologies to streamline their solar operations. Contractors can save up to 90% of their time on site and triple their project capacities by using drones as an example. They're staying off the roof, we're reducing roof time, they're getting perfect measurements, uh, and they're having zero change orders and redesigns. And some of the shading tools that drones and Scanfly software allow have equal accuracy to the SunEye um, and are also approved by most regulators. All right. 
for us, the objective at Scanify is to bridge together uh, your sales and proposal tools with your construction docs, right? Providing technology and other tools to get people trained to drive that workflow forward. So we're really focusing on streamlining the survey and design processes that go on in solar. And a note about who we are as a team, um, everyone who is not a software developer at Scanify is a former solar surveyor, designer, project manager, or installer. We've done every job in the industry except been on the manufacturing floor. Um, we have a combined over 8,000 solar projects under our belt. Many of us are NAPSEP certified, and many of us have taken SCI classes, as you'll hear as we introduce some of our team. Uh, and so we know firsthand what many of you are going through as it relates to the solar workflow day to day. Two areas of free training development that we want to bring up before we move to the presentation. Um, on the topic of training, we offer a free four-hour monthly solar drone training program called the Surveyor Associate Program. Uh, these are remote classes. It's just one hour a week for four weeks. Uh, so far, over 1,200 people have registered in the last four months, with dozens of them getting the official certificate. Um, we have two more cohorts coming up in April and May. These are the dates we just announced. Uh, and for those who attend and complete all four sessions, you're actually eligible for four hours of NAPSEP CE credits. And if you take the program, pass the Scanify certificate and get your drone license in the US, we'll actually reimburse the $175 cost of your drone license. Uh, so all in this could be a free program to get up to speed on some of the latest technologies in solar. A second resource that we offer for free is how to build a solar drone program. This actually was first introduced with SCI last May. And so there is a recording if you wanna see that webinar, but we also have this comprehensive uh, how to build a solar drone program handbook that's free on our website. Um, it's a full playbook as to how to build out a program and integrate new technology into your company's workflow. All right, so to continue the theme of technology and the tools to drive the future of workforce development, I'm gonna pass the presentation over to my colleague and Scanify's founder and chief product officer, John Novak. Um, John's been in solar for over a decade and he's worked for several contractors in survey design and technician roles. Uh, he actually started his career in solar in part because of SCI, taking classes as he started his first job in the industry. And he actually still has his SCI textbooks from over 10 years ago on his desk. So I'm going to turn it over to you, John, and, and I'll keep clicking through the slides when you let me know. Great, great. Thanks so much, Jason. And, and thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Super, super exciting um, for, for you to be here and, and allowing us to, to share everything with you today. So cool. So let's go through the, el the, the evolution of uh, survey tools in solar. Okay, so let's let's start with those manual tools, right? We've all used those, right? The pitch and slope calculator, the the measuring tape, and the the clipboard or the piece of piece of paper that's that's blowing in the wind as you're trying to jot down those those dimensions and keeping your balance on the roof. All right, we've we've all used those, but we we've, we've started with those manual tools. Next came the remote tools, right? Where we have Google Earth uh, as an example that allowed us to, to measure on the map, it was really cool. It gets us to, to a point where we could start doing things remotely and start doing a preliminary design, which, which has been helpful thus far. So now we have reality capture, super, super exciting. So now let's use a sensor, in this case, a camera strapped to a fully autonomous flying robot in this case, the drone to capture reality, right? Let's, let's, let's capture uh, A, the area proposed for solar and B, the area uh, surrounding uh, that area proposed for solar, right? We need that real world context when designing. So in other words, we can now create a two scale virtual replica of the property that allows us to really have all the information that we need in one place and an opportunity to acquire that data in a very efficient and uh, safe way. Okay, so next, let, let's go through the evolution of shade tools uh, for solar. So the Pathfinder, uh, tried and true, we've all started, uh, not all of us, but, but some of us uh, who are veterans in solar have, have started with the, the Pathfinder, right? Setting up that tripod on a steep roof was, was never really fun or, or safe, but this uh, transparent convex plastic dome really allows us to start capturing those obstructions and see what's in the sun's path and taking that picture of the solar access view shed, uh, then you know, tracing along the way there and seeing, seeing um, what, what is uh, causing that shade and, and really quantifying that data. Then the sun eye came around, 
this uh, this image here is showing a version two. Uh, version one had this uh, metal cover with this level or carpenter's plum to make sure it was level. That, that was a lot of fun. But um, this this tool allowed us to digitize uh, on site the, the way that we capture those obstructions and those solar axis view sheds. Uh, in this case, for the sun eye, they are called uh, skylines. Uh, this still requires you to get up on the roof, though, and, and walk around a large commercial site for a few hours and, and capture those, those view sheds or those skylines. Um, it's not very efficient, but it, it was the next step uh, to digitize the way that we, we capture uh, on-site uh, obstruction and shade data there. So uh, this is not to mention that there, there was some post-processing uh, involved there with the SunEye. So next, remote tools. This, this allows us to see the potential, right? Uh, the, the solar potential at a, at a higher level, right? It's not very granular, but it, it still requires an on-site visit, but it, it gets us a little bit further, right? It helps us with the preliminary design. <clears throat> and now with Scanafly, right? We, at Scanafly, uh, we, we have patented a, a very unique uh, shade analysis that allows you to capture those solar access view sheds that are similar to the uh, SunEye and the Pathfinder uh, it, directly in that 3D mapped environment, in that virtual replica of, of that 3D space there. So you can click anywhere and uh, generate those solar access view sheds and uh, acquire the, the, the TOF, TSRF data as well and uh, export a, a patented uh, and bankable uh, shade report uh, that is also accepted by, by Mass CEC, NYSERDA, uh, Austin Energy, and uh, uh, a few others, so ETO as well, Energy Trust of, of Oregon. Cool. Okay, so now let's let's talk about the evolution of design tools. I, I love these these two uh, these two photographs here. The early days of of design, right? Using a 30, 60, 90 triangle, a T square, uh, a, a pounce bag, uh, all of that. It's, it was a lot of fun and certainly an art form uh, in its time. Uh, it's really really amazing to see that you can create these isometric drawings uh, generated from, from elevation and plan views by hand. Super exciting, but you know, obviously not very efficient. Uh, if you could think about um, how, how buildings were, were built back, back in the day, uh, just, just using the, this method, and just imagine uh, what that change order process uh, looks like <laughs> using the, the hand drafting method. So, so pretty wild, but you know, we've, we've started here and we, since then, have obviously moved moved on uh, to the next next slide, please. Cool. So, okay. Uh, so now we have this um, personal computer, right? So the the PC uh, is is now is now here. This is the the 80s, and the the PC just changed everything. And uh, AutoCAD uh, being being available um, in in the 80s and the the digitizer uh, also being available changed the way that we create these drawings and and also you know scanning them in and digitizing them. So you could even do this. Uh, you could see even with a with a vest and a tie on that that was the way to do things then. But you know super exciting. We we've gone from this this manual method to now digitizing things and, and using the computer uh, to to make things more efficient. Okay, so so now we can take this this wireframe, right? This two D wireframe that was created using this thing called the computer, right? And you know, digitizing your drawings. We have this two D wireframe, and as as technology has evolved, we go from a two D wireframe to a three three dimensional wireframe. Then the three D wireframe to adding surfaces to that wireframe, really creating this 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 more manifold three uh, D model. Right, and then adding textures to those simplified models, right, to those surfaces and rendering engines, and starting to visualize what that building, what that structure will look like. Well, now there's there's photorealistic 3D models in in Scanafly, super super exciting, right? So with the advent of um, autonomous vehicles, cloud computing, and the massive improvements in computer vision, we can now create these photorealistic uh, photorealistic models that allow us to have this real world context when, when we design. So it's, it's super interesting. We went from digitizing 
your drawings to digitizing the worlds that we're designing in and using this virtual replica as a canvas for designing. So it's really, really awesome. Okay, so with, with design tools, right? So, uh, you know, now no, looking at the ev evolution of these design tools, we have satellite imagery, right? Which is commonly used for, for design, more on, on the preliminary design, uh, design side of things, where sometimes th that imagery can be distorted. The image on the left-hand side is showing this satellite imagery is not 100% or orthorectified. Um, in other words, those inside those circles there, you'll, you'll notice that you could see the, the facade of the building of that structure, meaning that it's not a truly uh, top-down top -down view or orthographic projection, right? It's not been orthorectified to remove that perspective or that skew out of the image. So, so that could be a challenge sometimes when designing just using satellite imagery. Um, on, on the right-hand side there, a pixelated uh, satellite imagery there. Sometimes it could be very, very pixelated and there's a lot of guesswork there. Are there parapet walls? How tall are those obstructions? And uh, are there are there trees? Are they have they been cut down and so on? So there's a lot of guesswork there. So you could see with the with that same satellite imagery with with the pixelated example, the the image on the right hand side is an orthomosaic uh, map, a 2D map that was generated using drone data. Um, it's it's basically a mosaic of those images that have been orthorectified right, and stitched together and uh, that skew being removed, right? That perspective being, being removed. And you could see there's, there's that clarity difference, right? You, you could see there's a huge difference when uh, comparing and uh, contrasting the two there. Great, so satellite imagery is also often used to, to uh, trace uh, the, the structure. And the, the example on the left-hand side, you'll notice that 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 example uh, again has not been orthorectified. So you see that that perspective view. You see the western facade of that building, and it looks like there's a lot of vegetation on site. And you know this is also 2D. That's a 2D uh, environment. Now you can all you can trace the 3D model in Scanifly because you have a 3D uh, a virtual replica, a two scale virtual replica of of that property. So you can trace that as well. We also have um, automated. Uh, method and functions in in the 3D modeling software that allow you to do that auto automatically. But you know, think about you know which one you would rather trace, right? And which one is is, is more accurate, and which which example here has the most data that adds a lot of value for you. Great. Okay. So last, uh, maintenance tools, right? So uh, those the IV curve tracers and the the multimeter, right? Getting out on site. And and troubleshooting the, these arrays, doing the commissioning as as well, right? Super manual, you know, not the best uh, approach, but you know, it's still it's still common practice uh, to this day. So uh, so now we can use drones, right? Those those thermal cameras add a ton of value here, where we can spot those defective uh, PV cells, any, any hot spots or any cells that that are are not working uh, correctly. Uh, there's an opportunity here to, to really uh, acquire this data as efficiently as, as possible and also quantify it uh, more too. So, so yeah, very cool. So I'll hand it over to, to Jason. Great. Awesome, thanks so much, John. It's fascinating to see how the evolution of tools in our industry has driven, are driven by new technologies. Um, and, and also we do have a, a long way to go when it comes to the future of solar's workforce development efforts. Um, and so that's where I'd love to go next is thinking about the tools that John, John just walked us through and the evolution of those tools as we've evolved as an, as an industry, and then talk with a couple of solar experts about what their experiences are growing in the industry. Um, so I wanna open it up for a discussion. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen uh, here. Let's stop that for a second. And I'm going to recommend that people move into gallery mode so they can see the panelists at one shot. Um, and what I'd like to do is, uh, well, what we, what we typically like to do at Scanify and when we work with partners like SCI is try to put together a, a diverse panel, both representing different sectors in solar, roles in terms of the jobs that are done, and also backgrounds, personally and professionally. Um, so please welcome uh, Jennifer, Tom, and Daniel. 
Um, and also Chris is gonna be joining us for a panel as well. And so if you guys wanna turn on your videos um, and what we're gonna do is, is jump in and, and have a, a group discussion for the next 20 to 25 minutes or so uh, about um, what it looks like in our industry as it relates to tools, technology and workforce development. Okay, so welcome guys. So um, to start, what I'd love to do is for each of you to share uh, about yourselves. So if you could do a very brief bio, uh, talk about how technology has impacted your career. Um, and then I'd love for you to speak to your personal connections to SCI, because I think each of you have a pretty unique story. Um, we'll do Jennifer, then Tom, then Daniel. And what I'd love for you guys can just keep your answers, you know, within a couple of minutes at most, so we can get to the, the meat of the discussion. So Jennifer, over to you first. Hi, thank you so much, Jason and the SCI team for having me today. I'm really excited to be here and talk about technology and, and the growing industry that we're all in. So I am Jennifer Hirschman. I am the Community Relations Director here at Solve Energy. Uh, we're the largest EPC and services provider for utility scale solar power plant construction in North America. Got almost nine gigawatts across 26 states and manage a couple hundred projects as well. Um, I actually started with our group in 2008 as a pre-construction manager. I spent the majority of my career in commercial ground up construction as a project manager, owner's rep, uh, pre-con manager. Um, and then I switched over into this role. It was fascinating uh, at the kickoff of kind of where utility scale solar kind of started. Um, took a little bit of a break for a while. And then I came back as a community relations director about four and a half years ago. Um, my relationship with SEI has uh, grown over the last few years. I'm fortunate to be on their board. We also have a alumni, Stacy McKinney, that works in our um, SCADA group and is now our sustainability manager who brought um, to our attention Solar Energy International and all the great opportunities that they provide um, in this industry. So just happy to be here and to share and uh, collaborate with everyone. I'm over to you. Hi, yeah, thanks Jason for, uh, for uh, letting me uh, share my story here, maybe con contribute to the whole solar family here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Tom Gutierrez, I'm relatively new to the solar industry. Uh, uh, my background is a combination of construction project management, uh, sales and aviation. Uh, I'm a private pilot, fixed wing helicopter, as well as a commercial drone pilot. Uh, around 2017, uh, I was uh, heading to work and saw a big banner on the side of a building that said drones. I, I had to go and see what it, what it was all about. Uh, I walked in and uh, that's when my career took a hard turn. Uh, I ended up uh, being hired there. They were, they were a commercial drone leasing company. Uh, they were sh uh, shipping commercial drones uh, and specialized sensors to, uh, all over the US. Um, uh, after about a month, uh, uh, I was hired there after uh, uh, as an operations manager, as I said, and then uh, eventually be, uh, began specializing in uh, uh, drones for public safety. Uh, also taught classes in mapping and modeling, uh, FAA 107 certification and, uh, and LIDAR, things like that. Uh, I moved from there to a survey and engineering company. Uh, my task was to uh, develop their uh, fledgling drone program and integrate drone, uh, drone technology into their uh, there and the traditional landscape, uh, land surveying uh, workflows, um, uh, large infrastructure projects, stuff like that. Uh, meantime, I started uh, my own small company uh, specializing in aerial data collection, uh, mostly focusing on uh, the agricultural space, uh, flying multispectral sensors uh, over fruit crops uh, in Eastern Washington, Oregon, Idaho. Uh, I also flew a lot of cell tower inspections, uh, collecting data to construct 3D models um, uh, of cell towers, mostly for dish net network. Um, I, I started experimenting uh, on my own with thermal sensors, small thermal sensors, uh, close proximity to solar panels. And that's how I got started down the solar rabbit hole. And um, uh, during that time, I, I ran across Scanafly uh, online and I actually reached out to, to Jason and, uh, and asked, uh, uh, for his take on how an established drone service provider might might fit into the uh, solar design space. Uh, I remember him saying that uh, uh, in his view, the trend was uh, toward in-house data collection, uh, you know, in-house uh, uh, drone pilots, uh, but it might be worth reaching out to some local solar installers uh, to learn more uh, about what's happening in my region. Um, he also mentioned NABSEP, which I had never heard of, and, and he recommended an organization called SEI. Uh, so this is the early part of the pandemic, and I found myself uh, signed up for online classes at SEI, 
and and at the risk of sounding corny, uh, the the classes at SEI were were really inspiring to me personally, and and that's when I fell in love with solar. Um, as I as I mentioned in my previous life, I had a, an extensive background in sales, so I took on a position at Northwest Electric and Solar uh, here in the Northwest, uh, where I got a crash course on residential solar sales. Um, uh, uh, by the way, uh, Northwest uh, was and still is using Scanfly exclusively for their site evaluations and 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 their uh, their revised proposals. Um, uh, now I've joined a team, uh, uh, the sales team here at Artisan Electric and Solar, and part of my job is to integrate drone technology into into their daily workflow. So a little long winded, but that's 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 the full story of how we got into solar. Awesome, thank you. Daniel, over to you. You're on mute, buddy. Thank you, Jason. And uh, thanks, Tom and Jennifer. Uh, Thomas, I'm also gonna be a little bit corny later on, so uh, no, no problem there. Uh, so my parents are Colombian. I grew up in Miami, Florida. I went to college uh, in the University of Florida where I started my education in engineering and business. Uh, about two, two and a half years in, I went to a job fair and saw a lot of oil and gas people there. And I knew right away, this is not the direction that I want to head towards. Um, I, I really wanted to move in a direction with uh, just, that was different than that. And uh, I started my education in sustainability and sociology. Uh, when I graduated with that degree, I, um, I started with organic food, uh, with an organic food certifier. And then um, after about a year of doing that, I decided that I wanted to dip my toes in education. So I moved to Taiwan where I started teaching English and I would have stayed there a little longer than the year and two months that I was there, but the pollution was so bad that on its worst days, you couldn't see a skyscraper that was a hundred yards from you. Um, my students, I taught both young learners and business English students, and it was very common for them to have nosebleeds, especially the children. And that was something that was particularly difficult to watch, especially when it was just like an everyday thing that everybody just accepted. The teacher, the students would just calmly say, teacher Daniel, I have a nosebleed and we'd go and take care of it. So, uh, when I came back to the United States, I was teaching English online and working for an audiobook company remotely. Um, I wanted to move to Colorado, so I did. I, I quit the audiobook company job, but continued teaching English online and started driving for Lyft while I took SEI courses uh, that eventually led to landing my first solar job. So SEI really spearheaded me in that uh, career shift uh, back into a more sustainability focused uh, direction where I could actually do something about that global issue of um, that pollution that had been such a big part of my life uh, for over a year. Um, with that said, I've been a drone hobbyist for over six years. Uh, when I first started working in solar, I was doing site surveys and uh, there was definitely some resistance to technology. I was using the drone just to take pictures of structures and the designers loved it because it gave them so much more context. It wasn't until I got a job with Namaste Solar, uh, I was the first site auditor for them and they really wanted me to build that whole drone program for them and started using Scanify then. Uh, it changed my life and, and my work life and I knew that this was something that I had to take a role in spreading the word. Uh, so now I'm happily training other drone pilots and helping and helping companies start their drone programs. Uh, and that's what I do over at Scanafly now. So thank you all. And thank you SEI for mm. genuinely helping me make that shift. Thanks Daniel, that's great. We have, we have a bunch of different connections into SEI and a lot of different pathways into the solar industry and how we've gotten trained. 
Um, what I'd love to do right now is, is kick off our first question for Jennifer. Um, as you mentioned, you spend most of your time working on utility scale sites for Solve, um, and a lot of it's EPC work and O&M work, nearly, I think, nine gigawatts of, of projects. It's, it's really unbelievable how big the company is. Um, what does workforce training look like for you and, and the company and the workers that you guys work with? So, um, you know, it's kind of twofold. So we've got, you know, uh, office and then we've got field um, workers as well. And so when it comes to, you know, both entities, obviously safety is very important. Um, and so we've got a very robust safety program that everybody goes through and is continually, you know, being updated. Um, and then also, we also deal with uh, third party vendors that bring in um, these individuals that are working in the field for us <clears throat> because it takes you know hundreds of people to build a, a solar power plant and so we work with those teams um, whether you're coming in as a temp laborer or you're coming in uh, you know maybe up, working up into a project manager or if you're a new employee on board you go through the training program that we have at solve energy we've got a talent group that you know keeps that training um, you know fresh and um, and interesting for uh, everyone that's coming on board starting off with team tours um, so really engaging employees about what we're doing um, so that they kind of understand all the different facets of, of our organization. And then as they go and deploy their you know, specific area of work. Um, so it, for example, through our talent group, we have sp specific training modules for like our O&M field techs from entry level through uh, lead techs so that they can gain more experience as they move to the next level of their career. And then, the, then they get additional training that moves with them. Um, so it, we kind of make it a little mandatory so that you know as part of your career blueprint, um, we can create advancement opportunities if that individual is looking to move up in their career. Um, but even if you're not looking to move up in your career, we've got internal training modules that people can use as well. So um, I think, um, you know, whether you're a temporary worker or a permanent worker or temporary that can move into permanent, because that works too, um, that training piece is important and it's important to keep it um, internal and then also, um, you know, supporting them to do external training and providing that support, uh, monetary support for them to go and get that additional training as they see fit into their career, which again, SEI is a great complimentary tool, uh, tool to do that with, uh, with what we're doing in the industry. It's really great that you guys are going so deep on the training front. Um, we've heard that salaries for EPCs are going up. Um, retaining people can be tough right now. Um, how do you, and this is staying with Jennifer, right? how do you reinvest in your employees or how do you go deeper uh, than kind of the outlook you've just presented and give access to new technology, you know, getting people with additional skills? What are some of those key technologies that you think are driving the next generation of work in solar? We're pretty fortunate here at Self Energy. We've actually created some pretty... Um, um, interesting tech uh, technology pieces. Um, we've got a few um, ignition. Uh, we've got computer engineers that work for us that, you know, and then also operations control room with uh, OCC operators um, that are viewing in real time, you know, how uh, power plants are performing and, and how we're managing and maintaining those sites. So we actually create innovative technology in-house um, Ignition is one, uh, also Vitals, um, and then Sunscreen, which is a QAQC tool. So we're bringing the, that talent in-house. So they're, they're bringing the talent in. They're getting also additional talent. And then we're listening to them when they come up with innovative ways to, to manage the sites. And so I think with that kind of collaboration um, and also having an, a culture that um, that you hear what they're saying, you're, you're taking into account that they're doing things better in the field. Um, and then working with our vendors and partners to you know, mix all those things together and create that technology piece that's keeping them you know, safe, uh, productive, and then also drawing in uh, people that wanna work for us. And so I really think training and keeping a robust uh, open mind too, to hear about those new technology about what's going on, really I think just adds to keeping things interesting and, uh, and, and moving those technology pieces along. It's really great. You guys can do a lot of that um, in-house related training. I know not all companies are as big or as 
uh, resource efficient or diverse as, as you are. And so I hope as we discuss today, we can hear how some of the other contractors can do it regardless of their scale of a business. Uh, but that, that's really fantastic. Your group's investing in, in workers that way. I, I want to go over to Tom now. Um, I know that we've seen resistance to new technologies in our industry, and, and you've probably seen it in others. Um, certain companies take the plunge much sooner than others do. Um, you've spent your career integrating new technologies recently at some of the leading contractors. You mentioned, you know, you referenced Northwest Electric and Solar. Um, there's, you know, now you're at Artisan Electric. Um, how have you seen technology adoption hesitancy play out, right? People who are, who are slow to the retraining, who are slow to thinking about new tech. Um, how do you recommend people overcome it, juggle different things and, and ultimately get trained? Oh, okay. Um... Well, honestly, in the, the other, as I mentioned before, I worked a lot in, in agriculture and in, uh, you know, large land surveying projects and, and they're frankly more slower to adopt, I think, uh, new technologies. Uh, I don't know if it's because of a, a long tradition of, of doing certain things certain ways. Uh, it, honestly, in the, in the solar industry, it, it's, there's more of an openness I've, I've noticed in, and uh, you know, probably because everything's changing so fast, you know, new new uh, new products, new technologies are coming along uh, with what we're what we're actually dealing with. Um, that uh, folks are more likely, it seems like, to just say, "Yeah, let's let's give ne new technology a try." Um, the biggest hurdle that I see is is um, initially it just seems a little overwhelming. So take uh, take adding uh, drones. Uh, for example, you know, it could be any technology, but if you, if you take that, it's, um, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of folks that, that have experience with, with drones or very, or very little. And uh, it seems like a great idea at first. And then people usually start diving into it and it, and it looks, it looks overwhelming. Oh, we have to have, we have to be certified. We have to be legal. We have to be safe. We have to take, uh, we have to take, you know, figure out how to how to put this whole program together, and um, and that's usually where it stops. It, it may even make it to the point where a company buys a drone and then it sits there on the shelf. Uh, and um, I I think the 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 way to overcome that, um, it, really any new technology, is is to find if you're a company looking to to do something like that is to is to find somebody in your company that is really passionate about whatever this new technology is, um, whether or not they even have any experience in it, frankly. But if, if like, say you're a, you're a, a, a solar installer and you want to start adding uh, drone technology to, to doing your site surveys, um, if you have somebody in the company uh, that knows something about drones, great, that's passionate about it, that's excited about it, that that's who you want to support, and 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 because they're gonna they're gonna go down the pathway and and do what it takes, uh, e even if they don't know about drones, if they're good at video games, or if they have that type of of uh, of uh, mentality or or drive uh, passion for something like that, uh, that technology or or any other, that's who you want to support uh, uh, because they're they're gonna do what it takes after hours and. And you know, offsite to to naturally develop whatever it takes, and, and and show within the rest of the company how how really it's not that difficult. It's a lot of information, but it's not it's not that tough. And if you're uh, if you're uh, working for a solar company or want to, my advice would be be that person. Be be that person that reaches out and and looks for uh, the online training looks for the the YouTube videos. Anything you can get a hold of, if you find something that you that you are excited about, it, it's out there, and there's people willing to to help and guide you. And uh, and and there's a lot of resources. And be that person, and you, you will you'll lift everyone up. That's my advice. I want to grab that call to action there because that was fantastic, Tom, right? So if, if you are yourself an individual who loves tech, right, or into some of the themes that Tom talked about, you know, there are resources out there for you. There's an opportunity for you to speak up and own that at your employer and really step out into the spotlight and help drive workforce development across your company, not just for yourself. 
And if you're an employer or you're a hiring manager or you're a team lead or you're a leader yourself, figuring out who those technologists are on your team or in your company and, and empowering them to, to help the organization get to that next level in terms of development and training is really a key. That, that, that was fantastic. Um, Daniel, I want to go to you and, and kind of piggyback on what Tom was saying, because you know you were a teacher in Taiwan and, and you also then intentionally sought a career in solar. Uh, and you did that by taking SCI classes while doing multiple jobs at the same time, right? So I, I know you and I, are, we're both at Scanify and we see a lot of times people are um, you know, they're hesitant to take on new things um, and it's kind of tough to balance it all. So I'd love to get to hear both from your experience. How did you balance getting into solar while juggling multiple jobs? Um, what would you say to people who are trying to get into the industry, but struggling to find time to do that? First thing is really put it on your schedule, get a planner and, you know, it's all about organization and having that end goal, you know, you create that curriculum for yourself of like, okay, this is the amount of time that I have to get this certification. This is what I'm going to do. These are the classes that I'm going to take. And these hours every single day, or, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, these are the times that I'm going to dedicate to studying. And know that, you know, there, if you're in the middle of this career change, at least for me, the biggest obstacle is getting over this mental hump of like, what if I fail? What if it doesn't happen? What if, you know, I take these classes and it's for nothing. What if I make this investment in time and money and it doesn't pan out? You have to really push through that. And I think that's the most difficult part is, is really dedicating yourself to knowing that at the end, having faith that it's all going to be all right, you know, and, and knowing that this is something, if it's really what you're passionate about, if it's something that you really want, you're going to make it out all right. And I've seen a lot of people in the chat, you know, asking these kinds of things where they they're taking the courses and they're still not sure. They want to know how you're expected to have experience looking for your first job in solar. Um, and you know, there's a lot of options talking about technology. Courses for SEI are self-paced, so you have the freedom to take them whenever you want. There's so many options. Like I said, I, I quit the job that had the big time commitment and started driving for Lip, And that gave me a lot of freedom with my time, a lot more freedom to say, okay, this is for sure the amount of time that I'm going to dedicate every day to studying for these SEI courses. And at the end of the day, you know, my prior, my previous mentor in solar told me paper, paper travels. And so once you get these certifications, once you take these courses, you go to these interviews and, you know, my separate advice between dedicating yourself to taking classes in general um, and especially with SEI, just because I love their education so much, not just because they're all here, but genuinely, um, like Thomas said, it, it was very inspiring for me. Uh, start with that uh, RE100 class that they have that's free. You know, that's how I started off. And I, I knew that I had to keep going further. The second part to that is have that confidence. Know that you know your stuff. Know that, you're, that you've been dedicating that time. Once you go into those interviews, you let them know what you know, you tell them what your plan is, and you, you'll see that you, you will end up getting those jobs. And reach out to people, network. Um, finding that time can be difficult, but luckily we live in a time where we have all of these gig economy jobs. And for me, they're the ideal thing for making that transition. They're, they're so helpful and you know the, the resources are out there. And luckily we've got you know, everybody on this call, I'm sure if you reached out to us, we'd be happy to have a short discussion with you and kind of guide you in the right direction and let you know if you've got the right plan. Just uh, really, you know, chin up and, and dedication and organization. You can do it. It's awesome, Daniel. It's really inspiring. It really is. Um, we at Scanfly and I know I see I have seen a lot of people enter the industry, you know, figure out where they want to fit into the industry and taking courses and, and, and gotten jobs it does take some time for some, in some cases, but to Tom's point about our industry, typically we're, we're pretty open and collaborative and, um, and open to these things. Right. So it's, it's feasible. Um, Jennifer, I wanted, if you, if you, if you can um, touch on this theme here, but talk about it as it relates to rural areas, um, areas that are, are maybe less less affluent. I know your, your company is operated in some kind of older coal mining towns. Uh, talk to us about what, what workforce training and development looks like in, in those communities um, where there might be some challenges or, or tech isn't as available. 
So this is my sweet spot because this is kind of where I bridge my, my prior experience into community relations because we do work in, in those areas. Uh, well, all of our power plants are built in rural areas because you need you know large um, land masses. And so that's just where they sit. Um, but it's also, we have a responsibility to bring employment opportunities to those areas as well. So, I mean, the, the clean energy goals that we have in the US is 400,000 solar jobs by 2030. And we're all in it together to, to get to these goals um, as we're in this energy transition. And one of the most important things is that we need all, everyone. We need that the people that we're, when we're going into these rural areas and we are hiring pretty much 99% is coming from the local community. We have our traveling teams, uh, core teams that go across the country uh, building these projects, but we're, we're bringing in the individuals from that community. So we're, we're working with the local agencies, the, the EDCs, uh, the community colleges, um, everybody is in it to get the word out, to bring in the workforce that's needed. And honestly, we've hired a large majority of our, uh, our uh, employees have come from those third party organizations that we work closely with to, um, to promote them. So, I mean, if you are interested in it and, and to Daniel and Thomas's, you know, testament to them is be curious and, 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 you know, you, you love being in solar and, you know, there's a place for you for sure. And so many different jobs are available. Um, I mean, we have a photographer that is that is on site for us, right? We have drone operators and uh, we have OCC operators. We have people like myself, marketing directors, government affairs. So there's a place for everyone. And I think that's the biggest um, uh, and most important thing is that um, when we're in these rural communities to say there are all these opportunities and that we will um, bring you in first and foremost, we're gonna you know, train you, um, you know, on our safety requirements to make sure that you're always safe on the job. But then um, we're, we're eager to share information. You're gonna learn from everyone around you and everybody is you know excited to be in the industry and so they want everyone to do well that is interested in being in this space so so that part that training part's easy and then also like i mentioned all the different training opportunities that we have that are um uh, that, that we've got available and then just even new opportunities we do some really cool things uh with what we call power hour and so we've got um, like in our battery group they just did a power hour where they talk all about energy storage uh, we were going to have one on government affairs and everybody is privy um, and gets uh, the information to be able to participate. So all the way down into the field, they're virtual now. So again, so many things are accessible all the time to get additional information um, because we are in this, you know, kind of virtual world now. Um, it does provide a lot more opportunity and it creates a bigger reach. And so that's where we really focus on getting that reach out so that we can uh, tell people that there are these opportunities and how exciting it is to work in this industry. And again, um, we're in an energy transition. Um, this is where we're moving into clean energy. And so it's like anything, it's an evolution of, of power distribution and power consumption. And that's gonna come from building the power, power plants as well as grid infrastructure. So lots of job opportunities for everyone. Thanks, Jennifer. I, I love you bringing the perspective as it relates to communities. Um, that is definitely something that's unique to the panel here. Um, I told our I told our panelists that we're, we really should not focus too much on drones, but I am going to say that as it relates to technology adoption, and I've put some links in the in the chat as we've been going. I'm going to put another link for the group as we've done some studies at Scanify around um, hourly wages for surveyors, and we have proven that you know if you add the additional drone skills, you can actually command a couple do dollars more per hour. And so I'm going to post that that article here that actually references several contractors that we know well that people can look at it from a data perspective perspective on that. Okay. Um, I want to I want to combine the different um, experiences of our panelists and bring Chris back into the discussion. Um, I just got to say again, it is amazing that SCI has 30 years of solar workforce development. Um, you know, forgive my na my naivete being in the industry only 10 or 10 to 12 years, but you know, is that like SCI training? You know, people on panels that they're putting on satellites or the solar hot water systems? Or like, think about what solar panels were like 30 years ago, right? In the industry, it's it's unreal. Um, you know, so what I wanted Chris to talk about is, uh, you know, we have different sectors in our industry, right? There's massive solar fields that are utility scale size. There's CNI and DG, and then there's Resi. How does training look 
uh, how does training look and feel between the different sectors? Um, are there, is it transferable? Are there specific skills that would benefit in each sector that you want to pursue or you currently work in? So if you could talk about the different sectors and how training relates to it in, in curriculum, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. Uh, that's a really great question, Jason. I actually really want to tie it back to something that Jennifer was saying, is that, you know, one of the things that we, we always tell students that come to SCI is that you're looking, you know, solar is a career, right? You know, a lot of times you're thinking about like that job, you know, maybe the first job you're trying to get in the industry, but, you know, it's an entire vertical, right? You know, you've got everybody from marketing to accounting to installation. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about installation as kind of that core area. Everybody kind of has that visual picture of somebody being up on a roof, but, you know, it's an entire basket of jobs and career opportunities opportunities that are in the industry. And what we love to do here at SCI is we, we definitely believe as part of our philosophy is that that education and training that we provide is part of that exploratory pathway to kind of having you find like where in like the niche that you want to go. Do you want to do residential? Do you want to do commercial? Do you want to do utility scale? And then, you know, looking at you know, what Tom's background is and Daniel's background, looking at your transferable skills that you have from previous job experiences that you might have Combining all of that together really helps us as a training organization kind of connect you with the right training training pathway and also the employer that you may want to, to work with. And so, you know, if there's any employers on this webinar today, you know, one of the greatest things about SCI is that we have over 85,000 alumni worldwide. You know, think about that for a second. Um, one of the things, one of the most frustrating things for me is when we're talking to employers, regardless of what marketplace they're in, they're like, you know, I just can't find any qualified candidates in my area. I'm just like, get a hold of SCI. Just we have got a massive database of people that are current, currently taking classes from us or have taken classes, you know, in the last 10, 15 years. So one of the things SCI is doing to ramp up that, that focus into each one of those categories that you were talking about, Jason, is really looking at how we develop uh, our, our curriculum and our learning pathways. And we're really listening to industry to make sure we're coming out with programs of study, whether it's an entire certificate program, taking hundreds of contact hours from SCI that leads to something that will be specific to that, you know, one of those sectors or areas that you mentioned, or maybe you are already actively working in the industry and you need continuing education hours on specific technologies or areas. SCI's program is flexible enough to basically provide whatever it is you're looking for, wherever it is you are in your career trajectory. One of the awesome things that we talk about at SCI is that it's, you know, we talk about NAPSEP a lot, which is very critical for, you know, some positions in the industry. We are huge supporters of NAPSEP and having that certification is hugely important for your resume, resume builder. But we always like to say it is a journey and not just a destination, right? You're not just leading to that certification. You're constantly going to be working and you're going to be working for an employer like, you know, Jennifer was talking about. They, you're going to get this baseline learning of SCI and you may go work for an employer like uh, Jennifer and you're going to have that continuous cycle. And so here at SCI, we really look at it as a, like that 360 degree feedback loop. We're constantly working with employers to crank out new programs of study. And going back to what we talked about at the very top of this webinar, like the SCI Engage program that we're launching, where it is going to be that it is that more tailored approach of serving employers, right? So if you know employers want to have that opportunity to work with SCI, we now have that platform to, to build that and to serve your needs. But if you're just looking to get into the industry, SCI's program really is that place for exploratory learning to kind of figure out where you fit in and working with our career services and our student services team to kind of have those one-on-one -on -one discussions of see where it all fits in. So yeah, I mean, it's an amazing time to be in the industry. I've been with SCI for 10 years now, and it's just absolutely mind-blowing the kinds of jobs that are available today and they're going to be available tomorrow. So yeah, super exciting. Awesome. Th thank you, Chris, for that. I, I think what I'm going to do is I have a bunch more questions to ask the panelists, but what I want to do now is why don't we go to the drone giveaway to be sensitive of people who are kind of locked into this hour. And then those of us on the panel who can stay afterwards, um, let's continue a dialogue for a few minutes after the top of the hour. We can also address some questions. Um, so I guess everyone keep your videos on on the panel. I'm going to share my screen. We're going to do the drone giveaway and then we can come back and do Q and A. And those of us who can stay late, I, I know I can stay late. We'll continue to do questions and we'll have a, continue the discussion. Um, so let's hang tight here. Um, you know, I just want to say before we transition, just like a huge thank you to the panelists in particular, for those of you who are going to be um, stepping out. Um, it's really amazing your different experiences. It's inspiring to hear um, how you've gotten to the industry and then what you're contributing to it. And so truly, thank you so much for that. Okay. All right. The drone giveaway. Let's do it. 
So uh, I'm going to share my screen again, um, and then you know we'll 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 do this. So uh, we've got here a drone. Um, the drone is the Autel Evo Nano, which is 249 grams, uh, and it is the first in the world to have obstacle avoidance with this uh, size package. Uh, so it's it's very small actually. Autel is a drone manufacturer, and it's created the Nano uh, to compete with DJI's Mini Drone. Uh, and it, it's really a lot more capable than DJI's Mini in a variety of ways. It can travel up to 34 miles per hour. It can fly in winds upwards. It, it can fly for uh, about, sorry, it can fly upwards about 28 minutes or so in total time. So it's about two to three residential solar surveys. Um, and it's equipped with a variety of different sensors that are very dynamic for its small size. Uh, the obstacle avoidance feature on this drone is unparalleled in its class. Uh, the package that we're gonna be giving away uh, for the Nano is the premium bundle. It's going to include the drone, a controller, three batteries, a dock charger, carrying bag, accessories, and it has a list value of $1,100. Um, so let's, let's, let's randomly select someone. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to call out a name. And if you are here, uh, post in the chat saying here. And that's how we'll know you're actually on. So we're going to be looking randomly at the registration list, and we're going to be pulling a name out from that list. Okay, so, so here goes. So uh, the first name that we're going to pull out is, is Sandra Miller. Let me open up the chat. Is there a Sandra Miller here? We have everyone saying here. That doesn't help because I can see that your name is not Sandra Miller. All right. <laughs> well done, people in the chat. Well done. <laughs> that is so unhelpful. <laughs> All right. We're going to go for Okay, she isn't here. Th thanks, Patrick. Very helpful. <laughs> um, All right. Let me look for another name. Okay, randomly selecting. Uh, is, is Chad Procolo here? Oh, he is. Hey! All right. <laughs> awesome. Okay. All right, Chad. Super. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone, for hanging on. Uh, Chad, I think we have your email through the registration. Um, so I'll reach out to you personally to connect you to get the drone in your hands. Congratulations. Um, uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, thank you for your interest in the topic. Uh, and, and most of all, you know, thanks to our panelists and above everyone else, thank you to SCI for, um, for everything. Honestly, for being lead the leaders in our industry, for driving workforce development, um, for steering us and doing it with the right culture and attitude and approach to growth and development and training. Um, and, and honestly, I think with the energy we have in the chat and everyone who's joined and what SCI is going to do as the leader in our industry, uh, the future seems pretty bright for where solar energy is going to go. So. A tremendous thank you to SCI above all. Um, so I think we'll, we'll wrap up here. I, I'm going to stay on if there are questions, if that's okay with you, Chris. I don't know if you want to turn the recording off or keep it on, but those panelists who are free to stay on or those who presented, let's let's continue our dialogue uh, for a few more minutes and we can also tackle questions live. So I guess, Absolutely. Chris, what do you want to do next? I'll turn it back. Yeah, no, I definitely think let's keep it going. Um, I've got a little bit more time. So uh, yeah, maybe uh, Jason, you and I can maybe kind of look through some of these questions we've got uh, coming in here. Tons of questions, a lot of good ones. Um, you know, I think a lot of the ones that I was seeing, you know, it's this idea about there's this, there's this challenge right now, or it has been for a long time in the solar industry of a lot of companies are looking for experience. Um, so what's, you know, experience versus training, right? And so we, you know, SEI, we really believe, you know, getting that proof of some level of training from SEI, you know, through that record of completion, that does indicate to an employer that you are willing to put forth that effort. And again, it's, it's a journey, not a destination, right? So a lot of employers have given us feedback that they say, if they see that SEI training, whether it's a certificate program or a single record of completion from one of our courses, it gives them an early indicator that a person is dedicated to the continuous education it's going to take to be pro um, professional and proficient in the position that they're being hired for. The other thing too is we we um, you know uh, we partner with Grid Alternatives. Grid Alternatives is a fantastic way to get out there and to get some real uh, real world job site hands on experience through a volunteerism opportunity through Grid Alternatives. So definitely check them out if you're looking for some job site experience. So um, and again, working with our career services and student services people here at SCI, we we love listening to, you know, the, the career goals of a student and trying to, you know, we connect them to an employer. I mean, we've got, you know, dozens, dozens of employers that work with us every single month that we would love to connect them with. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, maybe taking some of these questions here that we've got coming in here. Uh, do you have classes and how to interconnect solar farms into the grid? And what are some of the 
certifications that are needed. So yeah, I mean, uh, SEI, a lot of times we hear people talking, Jennifer, I think you made this comment the other day about, you know, you need to learn those building blocks of these systems, right? And, you know, a lot of these large scale systems kind of grow out of those building blocks that we teach here at SEI. And I don't know if maybe you want to talk about some of the large scale systems that you guys are working on potentially. Yeah, so yeah, there's a couple of different ways that you can connect, right? You can you can um, do a you know a, a straight interconnect depending on where your transmission line is, and then you have also got a gen tie system. So you know that's where like you mentioned building blocks. I, I think it's I wish everyone would take like an introductory course to solar. I mean, we kind of teach a, a class here for our employees called behind the switch because most people don't know what turns on your light switch and you know on the on the line, but it does provide that opportunity for you to then explore maybe what pathway you want to go into, right? So, you know, when you're dealing with utility, um, with grid tie, you know, that that's a completely different skill set than being, uh, being in marketing, obviously, or even being, uh, you know, a, uh, driving piles or being an operator in the field. Um, that's a high voltage, um, you know, so you, you know that you're going to, you know, kind of you have a building block and then you know kind of where you're going to go in your career um, to be able to have that expertise um, to be able to do that type of, of grid tie work. But again, so many jobs, right? I mean, we're, we're going to be building all this clean energy and there is going to be decommissioning of non-renewable sources. Right. And when that happens, um, you can have a lot of power plants out there, but if you can't tie them to the grid because the grid infrastructure isn't there to receive the power, then you know you don't you, you see it you think it's going on the grid but you don't know how much of it's going on the grid right not not always a hundred percent of that power plant is landing on the transmission line given right. the way that that power is pushing and pulling every day uh in 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 you know in the country so um so i think that grid infrastructure is really important too and all the jobs and they still have those layers too right they have um, you know, the utilities, they, they are managing from the transmission line and they have those layers um, as well as the same type of community relations outreach. And so again, there are just so many jobs in the industry that to think outside the box, but I think a building block is a good one to just introduce yourself to the industry because it helps to understand some of those basic components, whether you are in marketing or you are actually, you know, driving piles in the field. So, yeah, yeah. We definitely see a lot of that in our kind of the way our students flow through our training program. I mean, most everybody starts with our PV 101 class that kind yeah. of gives them those big building blocks. And what we find and a lot of it is dependent on like those transferable skills that I was talking about, those past like career experiences that they've had. They, you know, they might say, you know, what, I want to go into installation, but during that class, they're like, well, you know, maybe I want to do more like sales and, you know, design. So, you know, we, we then, then, you know, advise them to go like into our solar business and technical sales um, pathway. So, yeah, that's why I like that idea of that exploratory learning within the building blocks phase. So that way you're not, you know, going into an area maybe that you really isn't going to be a good fit for you. So, um, but it's great to know that there's so many different jobs out there and we love working with employers like yourself to, to make that connection. So, and I do second the motion on grid alternatives. Um, we're going to mm -hmm. do it again, but before the pandemic, we take out a group of, of, people in our office and did a roof install. So I think yep. that's super important, you know, given whatever your position is, is to either, you know, and we also make, a, um, uh, when we have projects that are close to any of our corporate offices, most of them are not, we do encourage people to get out and actually, you know, see them. We, we have videos and different things like that, but it is different than seeing it in person. But it's great if you can actually get on the roof and, and install something, because again, the components are the same. It just depends on what you're powering. Um, but your, the, tech, the, um, the, uh, the technical pieces, they grow depending on the size of the system, but some of the terminology is the same. So it's, again, to your point, the building blocks, and you can start on this baseline, is really a great way to help you decide what you kind of want to do in the industry. Absolutely. Yeah. And just one more plug too. you know, SEI has one of the most well-known uh, lab facilities in, in the entire country. And a lot of people come out to Payonia, Colorado. They make that journey. They make that pilgrimage out to Paonia, and it's it's a great place to have that opportunity to get onto those roofs and get your you know your hands dirty and roll up your sleeves and learn about all the different you know roof penetrations and and PV system types that we have out there at the lab facility, and in, even in, in that situation, like when Grid Alternatives on the Front Range has had um, volunteer opportunities that coincides with that same time. Again, we're coming out of COVID, so hopefully we're going to get to that same place. But we've had a lot of students that have spent like an entire month 
or a week in uh, Paonia did their lab and they had the opportunity because it, it actually coincided with a grid alternatives install like in Colorado, which was pretty awesome. So yeah, it's, uh, you, you got, you, nothing beats getting your, your hands on those components and learning how to put them all together. Chris, I wanted to, I wanted to jump to a different question, if that's okay with you. Sure. I wanted to pull back Tom and Daniel, because I, I limited their bios at the beginning and I really wanted them to go a little bit deeper into their journeys um, to getting into the solar industry and specifically on the resources, maybe even the classes, the programs, like, like my, my impression is people who are probably still on the webinar are looking to learn more about what the resource and options are out there. And so Tom, if you want to go first and then Daniel, I would love to hear like, I'm new to solar or I want to grow in solar or, or what skills should I learn? in solar? like, where should people turn? If that's the question, if you can get real as specific as you recall from your time doing it, you know, what, what are the resources and training materials? And, and even if there's specific SCI classes that we can shout out, um, would love to hear both of your perspectives on what people should do. Sure. Well, the, the, the gold mine that I hit was when I, when I somehow got onto the SEI website for the first time and I realized the, the wealth of information there. Um, so there's a, there, at that time, there was an initial, there was an initial free class that I signed up for. And uh, I, I saw the itinerary for it and everything. And it looked really interesting. Uh, I signed up and went, went through that. It was, it was fascinating. Then I realized uh, um, as he was mentioning that there's, there's different, uh, tracks to go on, depending on what you, what your interests are. Um, my, you know, I, I have a technical interest and I, uh, and I also have a sales interest. So I, I kind of looked at both of those, those ways. Uh, um, uh, but it made it, it made it so it wasn't so overwhelming because it was, it, there, these tracks, you didn't have to, there's so much available, so much information available there that it, it could be potentially overwhelming. Um, uh, it's the same thing with, with, uh, with anything new, the same thing with drones, it, you know, uh, you, you have to go through, you have to start off finding, you know, finding out what you don't know. <laughs> you can do that online and then, uh, and then you start weeding it down. Uh, there's, uh, there's tons of help uh, at SEI. There's, there's tons of help on, on, Different websites, the Scanfly website, they've they've uh, done a tremendous amount on just helping people to narrow down what uh, uh, here's the steps of what to do if you want to go in this direction, um, as far as training goes, uh, you know, with regards to drones. So the the information is out there. These are these are two fantastic resources. It's easy to get lost on the on the internet, you know, and and uh, get go down uh, down trails that uh, that just get frustrating. But that's that's where I would start. If you're interested in solar, uh, take a look at the the SEI website, and you'll you'll start to get your bearings. Definitely want to second that and, and kind of, you know, for, in my experience, I, I separated into three portions. One of them is learning, um, you know, a lot of self-study, like it was mentioned earlier, there's so many options on YouTube. Uh, there's Udemy courses that I took. Uh, and then of course, SEI. And um, after having all of that learning incorporated into my everyday life, um, the next part is uh, networking, you know, getting out there and, and finding ways to, to get involved in your local community with renewables. There are so many webinars that you can attend. There are so many local events with professionals, meetup groups. Uh, go ahead and get out there and, and just be curious. You know, don't, don't go out there with the mentality of, you know, I'm doing this for my job and, and placing that pressure on yourself, just do this because you feel passionate about it, because it's something that you genuinely want to do and you want to ask questions. And I'll tell you, if you reach out to somebody that works in a solar company, asking a question like, hey, you know, I, I'm looking into solar and I'm really curious about things. And I want to know, why do you like, do you use DC optimizers or micro inverters and, and, and why? You know, I, I promise you, you'll get a response there and that could lead to a phone call. You know, and so networking is that next part. And then the, the last part is to 
um, not be afraid to humble yourself. You know, I had no expectations of uh, starting off at the top in solar. I knew that I wanted to get out there and get my hands dirty and start installing. And no matter which direction I headed into, like it was mentioned earlier, I loved that this isn't just a job, this is a career. This is something that you have so much room to grow in. So being able to get out there and starting installing and, and doing that and knowing that if you show how dedicated you are, you show where your strengths are, you will be placed in the right location, hopefully within that company. And if it's not within that company, then great. You have that experience, you know, search for other people who will recognize that in you. Um, if you have that hunger, it will be recognized. Definitely. And sorry, I just want to say one last plug, just because there's so many people asking questions. If you have drone specific questions, reach out to learn at scanafly.com. Um, I manage that inbox. I'm more than happy to lead you in the right direction. Um, and of course, SEI, if you want to plug the right location to contact you all, that would also be appreciated by the people in the chat, I'm sure. Yeah, so we'll, we'll share our general, um, our general email address. But real quick, you said something, Daniel. I actually wanted to make sure this doesn't get lost. Um, the why. We have so many students that come to us and they, they land a job very quickly in the industry. And a lot of times they'll say, you know, I've been put into this role and they're, they're you know, I'm um, installing these specific components into a typical like package that maybe a residential, you know, installation company is putting in. And they're like, if, if I didn't understand the why, like why were those components chosen? Why was that site chosen? All of those other things that maybe a lot of times in those entry level positions, those decisions have kind of been made for you, you know, as you show up there. SEI teaches you the why behind all of that. And I think a lot of, I've heard a lot of feedback from students that come back to us to say, you know, if I wouldn't have taken those classes, I wouldn't understand the, the broader context of things. And I think that's sort of the, the big piece of that. And so Elizabeth, I think you were trying to say something. I, think so yeah, I was on mute. Uh, I just wanted to say to all the people in the chat who are asking questions about partnership, please feel free to reach out. Uh, we will put my uh, email uh, on the bottom as well at the end, uh, because a lot of community colleges and, and a lot of other organizations we can help, you know, hands-on, build hands-on learning for you. So definitely reach out to me. Chris, I want to see if, if um, we haven't got a chance to let John give his background. And so, John, I wanted to see if you had any additional resources that um, you're interested in, right? I know you've you've done a lot of different roles in, in the industry, and you have a pretty unique story about how you got into it. And so are there any other resources that you recommend or skill development areas, or, or if you want to share your story, and you know that will definitely be informative as well. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, happy to. So, what helped me? My background is a bit uh, unique, but you know, working in the industry, you know, um, there are, you know, working with 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 former colleagues, we shared a similar background, um, you know, in in terms of of having a background in architecture, you know, a landscape architecture, and just you know, drafting and you know, mechanical drawing and having. Uh, having a background in in architecture really helps. So you know that that if you're just looking to get into solar and you, you don't have uh, a, a direct pathway to being you know if, if your goal is to be a designer and design solar systems, uh, what, what helped me was my background in, in architecture and knowing AutoCAD and knowing how to create a 3D model using 3D modeling software and understanding the the base the basics of of creating dimensions and AutoCAD and you know, certain uh, commands there, that's really helped me. And if you're looking for that, that uh, you know, segue to kind of get you there, you know, uh, background in architecture, taking a few classes, maybe one or one or two classes at a community college, uh, can can be really really helpful. the The engineering side of of solar, more on the design side, I I, I guess. Um, everyone has a very unique background, and it's it's kind of a blend of of, of architecture, um, electrical and engineering, you know, con construction, and in other things. But you know, those are the big ones uh, that, that I've seen th throughout my career, and that, that could certainly help you jumpstart to to uh, to your uh, career in solar. Awesome. Yeah, it's funny because we we look at at Scanafly the different survey roles and designer roles primarily, and the skill sets required to get into those specific subsets in the industry are, are very different. 
um, but certain characteristics are important, right? Detail orientedness, precision, technology. Um, and then as you, as you kind of expand out of those core roles and you look at installers or technicians or project managers, then you see additional skills that become important. Um, but at the end of it, it's, it's core, there are resources for each one of those or broadly speaking for all of them. Um, Chris, there was a question that we didn't get to on the panel that I, I wanted to tie back in if you're open to it, was related to the DOE's program. Um, you know, so the DOE is organizing clean energy apprenticeships, um, and I know they're collaborating with SCI and IREC and SIA. Um, can you give us an overview of the program and, and any update possible? Uh, you know, where does tech play a role? We'd love to get some more information. Absolutely. So, um, you know, SCI is very involved in a lot of the committee work that's being done at all the different various levels of um, really our goal is to make sure that uh, solar is an apprenticeship opportunity for people to get into the industry through that. Um, I'm not sure if I just made up that word or not. But, <laughs> but, I mean, the, the challenge right now is that, you know, we have states that are uh, recognizing solar as an apprenticeship bull <laughs> opportunity, but we really want to see that happen at the federal level and make sure that that's an opportunity for people for solar markets all over the United States. And so we are part of the panels that are working through that. And it is, I will just say it's, it's actively in progress right now. We are working um, directly with SIA as our, as our main lobby, lobbying group and people um, from the DOE to really make sure our voices are being heard. And I think, you know, as an educational organization, our, our role is not lobbying, obviously that's through SIA, but we always like telling our students to, you know, make your voices heard, you know, contact your local, you know, representatives, uh, state and federal level to, you know, make sure that they know that, that you believe that this should be an apprenticeship program and that we wanna see that type of thing grow because that pathway of training and employer connection and we're already already doing that here at SCI. We're organically working directly with employers, but it's not through like a formal apprenticeship program yet. So once that can actually become a reality, just imagine the, the way we can fast track people into, into jobs all across the United States. And just to kind of ping off that is what's interesting, again, government affairs is a, is a career pathway. Um, politics play a huge role in, in um, the power industry in general. Um, but, you know, where, where there's legislation in place in states, that's where you're going to see um, uh, data on, on specific type of energy sources that are coming out of those states, such as California, right? We have legislation um, in place. We have a mandate to, to uh, for clean energy on the grid. Uh, I think, oh gosh, 2045. Um, but, um, so we're a leader. Right. Well, Texas doesn't have legislation, but they're the second in the nation. But you don't know that because they don't have legislation, so they're not they're not required to report those those things. So, um, as the as the the nation starts to close in on the midwestern states, because you know we're now in Wisconsin and Michigan, and we'll soon be into Kentucky. We've got some big projects in uh, Ohio, and then we've got probably going to end up being the largest utility scale. Um, solar uh, utility scale solar project in upstate Indiana um, is to do that because your voices are actually heard um, and we, we need people to, to, to support it because it does create jobs and it is coming. And so, you know, the more people know and are more educated, the more that we can get the word out there and all the opportunities. And a little bit back to what Daniel said is that I switched fields uh, I mean, there's a connector to what I do, to what I did in the past. I'm glad that I have that, that knowledge of, of what it takes to build a, a utility scale solar plant so that I can then talk to the communities about those job opportunities and then even reach down deeper into the K through 12 uh, education sector because kids are really smart um, in, in K through 12 now, not that they weren't, but there's STEAM opportunities, right? There's more robust science um, uh, programs in schools, they're getting exposed to this um, at a very young age. And so for them to know that there's like really cool jobs out there at all different levels is just like just bringing that next generation up to where um, then they're teaching us about new technologies. We're sharing our experience with them. And it's just, again, it's just creating a really great diverse workforce um, of, of all different types of people uh, in this industry. So it just makes it more fun that we're all doing it together. It's definitely a together thing. <laughs> There's, it, it requires a lot of, of teamwork on that. Um, and then I guess my other follow-up comment, Jennifer, is isn't it amazing we're talking about Indiana and Kentucky solar? It's, it's awesome how far this industry has come. 
Um, and, you know, I think all of us can remember when solar was like 50% California or, or whatever it was, or, or New Jersey SREX were $700 a pop, you know, uh, and, and now solar is really a 50 state you know how you know it's a global thing right and, and just by seeing the number of countries that joined on this webinar alone I, I saw people post in in india at two in the morning their time you know like how, how special is that so again another testament to everyone on the on the call here and um and to sci in particular um chris i think we should wrap up it is maybe maybe it makes sense to give everyone kind of any everyone have like a closing call to action for uh the remaining people here so um why don't we start with with john and then we'll do the three panelists and then you know, Chris and Elizabeth, why don't you guys take us off? So why don't we kind of have a closing call to action? So John, Jennifer, Tom, Daniel, and then the two SEI folks. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Jason. So yeah, th thanks everyone uh, for joining us today. You know, really, um, you know, it was really all awesome to share everything, uh, you know, exciting that's that's going on in the, in the solar industry, you know, everything that, that um, SEI is doing. You know, I, I really uh, loved, uh, you know, learning uh, from, from, from SEI when I first started in, in solar. And you know, it's just great to see where where the industry is going, where 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 SEI has has gone and is going as well, and you know where where the technology uh, is going as well. But yeah, thanks again, everyone, and uh, really appreciate it. Jennifer. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks again. This was um, really fun to be a part of this panel. I learned a lot from from all different viewpoints, but I think I'll just leave my parting statement is stay curious, keep learning, sharing information that you're learning with others. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the industry is not slowing down. We need a robust and diverse workforce and there are so many opportunities for anyone interested in solar. So um, whatever that looks like, um, SEI is a great um, place to start uh, to see if it's something you're interested in and um, maybe you'll apply for a job at Solve Energy. We would love to have you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, Tom. Yeah, th thank you, SEI, and thank you, Scanifly, uh, to to be able to participate in in something like this. I really I really appreciate it. Um, uh, if I had any parting words, it's uh, I think there's a lot of folks in 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 this uh, uh, in this that are looking for for new careers or no, looking for ways to, to make a difference in the world. That's, that's kind of what brought me to, to, to solar, honestly. Um, and I, I feel like I found a family here and I feel like I've found uh, that there, it's a little overwhelming at, at first, I, I grant you that, but, um, but there are folks that are, that they're dedicated to this. And the, the uh, a lot of the folks in, in, on these panels that, they're the real deal and and they're willing to help and you can reach out to them and maybe it's a little overwhelming at, at first but if you uh if you're excited about it just just plug away at it and uh and uh yeah go solar that's fantastic daniel my words are going to be short and sweet stay curious stay passionate and if you want a very specific call to action, a little bit of homework, if you want to challenge yourself, do one of two things, either look up a solar event close to you and go to it, or reach out to somebody in solar, could be anybody on this panel as well, and just ask them a question. Fantastic. And then uh, Chris and Elizabeth, I'll let you guys close us out. I'll, I'll let uh, Chris go last because he's been the grandmaster. And what a grand, great grandmaster you've been. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, you know, it is about cooperation. It is going to really take all of us and the, the heat and the high water are coming at us. So uh, it really takes us working together, forgetting about the, co the competition and really saying, what can we do? What can we do together well? And that's my message to everybody. So uh, if you have ideas for partnership, please give us a call, uh, email, and uh, we're with you and we are a family. So we look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. And I'll wrap it up with uh, everybody there at Scanafly and our panelists. Thank you so much for, for doing this. This has been fantastic. And what a great way to celebrate our 30th anniversary. I wish we could have done this. Uh, I was actually sick during the last conference, so I couldn't go. But this is a great way to do this virtually. And I always like to tell people, solar careers grow here at SCI and contact our student services department if you have any questions about career pathways or training pathways. Check us out at solarenergy.org. And thanks again for everybody for joining us. I still can't believe we have 100 people 
<laughs> still, still in the webinar. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for everybody for joining us and uh, stay tuned. We've got April 4th online set sessions starting up. So check out our website. Hope to see you online here pretty soon. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone.